Every day in Wellington, New Zealand, bus drivers have to perform a terrifying feat of precision. They guide their massive double-decker vehicles towards a dark, narrow hole in a hill, knowing that at the tightest point, the gap between the roof of their bus and the solid rock of the tunnel ceiling is just 100 millimeters. That is about the thickness of a modern smartphone. One bump, one sway, and the result would be catastrophic. This isn't a forgotten back road. This is the Karori Tunnel, a vital artery used by nearly 18,000 vehicles and 25,000 people every single day. How did a major city's gateway become so dangerously obsolete, and what incredible engineering proposal aims to finally fix it? To understand the radical solution, we first have to dig into a story of failure, collapses, and a project that almost never was. Back in the 1890s, the suburb of Karori was growing, but it was trapped behind a steep, winding road over a ridge called Baker's Hill. The solution was bold for the time, punch a tunnel straight through the hill. Construction on Wellington's first ever road tunnel began in 1897, but the hill fought back. The project was a nightmare, hit by constant slips and collapses as the earth gave way. The first contractor, John McWilliams, gave up and abandoned the job entirely. His replacement, Thomas Slowey, also failed to finish the work. Finally, the local Karori Borough Council had to step in and complete the tunnel itself in 1900, years behind schedule. This wasn't just bad luck. The ground itself, a type of notoriously fractured and unstable rock called Greywaka, was sending a clear warning, a warning that modern engineers would have to face head-on more than a century later. That troubled history, written in collapsing earth and fractured rock, is the exact reason why the new proposal isn't just for one new tunnel, but two. And the engineering behind them is on another level, proposed by the Karori Residents Association and designed by retired civil engineer Bill Guest, the plan is a complete reimagining of the connection between Karori and the city. The centerpiece of the proposal is a brand new two-lane road tunnel. At 350 meters long, it would be almost five times the length of the old one. To put that in perspective, you could lay more than three full-sized rugby fields end-to-end -end inside it. Unlike the old tunnel, which was originally built for trams and is almost flat, this new tunnel would be built on a steady 6.8% gradient. This means for every 100 meters a truck drives forward, it climbs nearly 7 meters. While that sounds steep, it's a perfectly manageable slope for modern engines and allows the tunnel to follow a much more direct and efficient path. It would start further north on Chator Street and connect to a road called the Rigi, completely bypassing the old tight corners and intersections that cause so much of today's traffic chaos. The entire purpose of this new artery is to solve the dimensional failures of the past. It would be wide enough for two full lanes of traffic, allowing cars, buses and trucks to pass each other safely without ever needing to cross the center line. And crucially, it would be tall enough to comfortably fit Wellington's double-decker buses, finally ending the daily 100mm clearance gamble. This tunnel is designed not just for the traffic of today, but for the next 50 years of growth in a suburb that is already one of New Zealand's largest. But this massive new road tunnel only solves half the problem. What about the people who aren't in a car? This is where the proposal gets truly clever. The engineers recognize that the biggest failure of the old tunnel was forcing everyone, cars, trucks, cyclists and pedestrians, into one dangerously cramped space. Their solution is to create a completely separate world for vulnerable users. A second, smaller tunnel, built exclusively for people on foot, on bikes, or in mobility scooters. This isn't just an add-on, it's a fundamental shift in design philosophy. This active transport tunnel would be 214 meters long, or about the length of two rugby fields. Its most important feature is its incredibly gentle 2.8% gradient. For every 100 meters you walk or ride, you would only climb about 2.8 meters. This shallow slope makes it an easy journey for everyone, from kids cycling to school to elderly residents in mobility scooters, a level of accessibility the current tunnel makes impossible. Inside, the tunnel would be four meters wide, about the same width as a standard city traffic lane. This space would be intelligently divided. A 2.5 meter wide, two-way cycle path would give cyclists plenty of room, while a separate 1.5 meter wide footpath would provide a safe, dedicated space for pedestrians. 
By physically separating cars and people into two different tunnels, the plan eliminates the conflicts that make the current route so hazardous. It creates a safe, efficient and even pleasant connection that encourages healthier ways of getting to the city. But to build either of these tunnels, engineers first have to solve the problem that nearly defeated the original builders, the ground itself. Wellington is one of the most seismically active cities in the world. It is crisscrossed by active fault lines, and the nearby Wellington Fault is capable of generating a massive magnitude 7.5 earthquake. For engineers, an earthquake isn't a possibility. It's a certainty that the design must withstand. The biggest danger isn't necessarily the tunnel barrel deep underground. Seismic assessments of Wellington's other old tunnels have shown that the main tubes are surprisingly resilient. The real weak points are the entrances, called portals, and the steep, unstable slopes around them, the very places that collapsed during the original construction in the 1890s. So how do you build a tunnel entrance that won't collapse when the world starts shaking violently? Modern seismic engineering provides the answer. The first line of defense would be massive reinforced concrete structures called buttresses built against the portals. Think of them as giant, super strong bookends holding the mountain in place so the tunnel entrance can't be crushed. The second tool is even more impressive, ground anchors. These are incredibly strong steel cables or rods, some many meters long, that are drilled through the concrete portal and deep into the solid, stable bedrock of the hill behind it. They essentially stitch the tunnel entrance to the mountain's strong inner core, preventing it from being shaken loose. The tunneling method itself would also be radically different. Instead of just digging a hole and hoping for the best, engineers would likely use a modern technique like the new Austrian tunneling method. This involves digging only a very short section of the tunnel at a time. Immediately after digging, the exposed fractured rock is sprayed with a layer of concrete called shotcrete and reinforced with long steel rock bolts. This process is repeated meter by meter, building the tunnel's permanent support structure as it moves forward and never leaving the unstable ground unsupported for long. It is a slow, careful and expensive process, but it's how you safely carve a path through a mountain that wants to fall down. So the engineering plan is ambitious, clever and designed for a shaky future. But a plan on paper is one thing, getting it built is another, and that's where this story takes a sharp turn. An engineering solution this grand comes with a huge price tag, and not everyone is convinced it's the right answer. The proposal includes a smart funding plan using a special law that would allow the project to be paid for by those who benefit, perhaps through tolls or a targeted local tax, without adding to the city's overall debt. But even with this plan, the project faces a huge challenge from a much simpler, cheaper alternative, the Bendy Bus. Metlink, the region's public transport authority, has been trialling articulated buses on the Karori route. These long, bendy buses can carry up to 114 people, a massive 70% increase in capacity over a standard bus. Crucially, they are designed to fit through the existing narrow tunnel. Metlink documents show that they already considered and dismissed the idea of a new tunnel, viewing it as a far too expensive option when bendy buses could solve the public transport capacity problem for a fraction of the cost. This puts the official transport agency and the resident's engineering proposal in direct opposition. On top of that, there is growing criticism in Wellington against building any new tunnels for cars, with many arguing it just encourages more traffic, a problem known as induced demand, and that the money would be better spent on public transport. So Wellington stands at a crossroads, with a 120-year-old problem and two very different solutions. The city is faced with a choice between a bold, permanent and very expensive engineering masterpiece designed to last a century and a more pragmatic, adaptive and much cheaper solution using better vehicle technology. The future of transport for 25,000 people in Wellington's western suburbs hangs in the balance. Is it better to conquer the mountain with concrete and steel or to outsmart it with clever, flexible design? What do you think is the right path forward? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoy these deep dives into the world's most ambitious engineering projects, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell so you never miss our next story.